Hello everybody, it's Shannon. And what's left of my plants over here? Uh, do you like the gear? I was actually at UT Austin's campus about two weeks ago for the second time. And I don't know, whenever I get new clothes, like I just wanna wear them all the time. So anyway, represent. It's weird I'm saying represent, even though I haven't, I don't even know if I'm gonna get in yet. Like I'm applying for a master's. I might not get in, I might get rejected. But in that case, I mean, I'll survive their loss, right? And I don't mean that in like an arrogant way. I know who I am, like I know I'm a hard worker and even if it, it, it'll work out with somewhere else, even if I don't get into that school. And that's kind of like the theme I'm gonna get into for this video for today. Actually, a side anecdote. So, just to give you an example of like rejection, right? So, when I was a kid, like I was applying to go to this high school, like there was a public school in the city where I grew up, Alexandria, Virginia. And it's like a magnet school, right? And so I think like the average SAT for kids coming out of there was like 1460 or something. And like you had to be really smart. Like you had to take, had to take like an entrance exam to get into this high school. I think it was called TJ. I know it was called TJ because <laughs> I got rejected from there when I was in the eighth grade, right? And it was kind of like, I was so embarrassed because some of my friends who were really smart, like they got in. I didn't get in. I didn't even make the first cut. I felt guilty, I felt ashamed, like I'm an, maybe like I'm an idiot, whatever. So I had to go to the regular public school, which was actually not a bad public school. So, I mean, West Potomac, it's not a bad school. Shout out to my fellow WIPO alums. Uh, but when I got rejected from that high school, it kind of gave me like a chip on my shoulder in the sense where I was like, I'm gonna be the student that they wish they had. And I mean, four years later, like I was valedictorian. I got into Wharton early decision. I was a national merit, not no semifinalist. I don't even remember. Uh, just like basically, yeah, like I was super like driven and, and I was a straight A student and things like that. And I don't want to say that's because I was rejected from the high school I wanted to go to, but it definitely, I think, played a role in the sense like I felt like I had to prove myself. So anyway. Let's tie this back to the whole theme of today's video. So today we're gonna to talk about, if I were to learn Arabic over again, here are some things that maybe I would have done a bit differently. So I don't know if any of you have seen, like there was a video I did almost 10 years ago called How I Learned Arabic in Dubai. And I hate watching myself in old videos. It's just like cringy because, I mean, I like watching myself when I'm in the editing process because I'm like, okay, I'm gonna change this and do this and cut this and whatever. But when it's already like out there and you're just like, okay, nothing I can do, I, I, it's cringy for me to watch myself. But anyway, I watched some of it. And I talked about like different like study methods that I used and uh, like how I practice Arabic and like how I, what I did with the vocabulary. Like I had an Excel database, which I still have by the way. So looking back, I was like, okay, what, you know, if I were to change things about my study process, what would I have changed? And the number one thing that I kept like kept coming up to me was I wish I had been more patient with myself and that's not like to say like oh I wish I you know oh to be patient with myself like oh I don't have to study you can blow it off whatever be patient with yourself don't, I mean don't look at it that way because then you're just gonna slack off I wish I had been more patient with myself in terms of like not beating myself up I mean I wasn't like self-flagellating or anything like every time I made a mistake I was just really like not happy or I would like be like, oh, I shouldn't have, you know, kind of like a perfectionist in some ways, which is really not healthy, especially like, I mean, yeah, that's a whole other topic, but um, I definitely was super impatient because I mean, I'm around all these native speakers and when you're learning and, and in Dubai, I feel like you're either, you're with people who don't speak any Arabic, like the other expats, most of the other expats, or you're with native speakers. Right, like there's nobody else who's kind of in the same phase as you in learning when you get to the higher levels or the medium levels of Arabic, at least in my situation. I had posted on my Facebook like 10 years ago, 2012, okay. I shouldn't have posted who said this, but basically like uh, somebody who was supervising me uh, when I was working that Sa in a Saudi media company, he said, it's a waste of time to learn any language other than English. That's what he told me, like I, and I quote. And that person was nine years older than me, had an MBA, had a higher paying job than me. And for him to say that, like when I was the one taking lessons from my own pocket, like paying for them too, was just kind of like, it was another chip on the shoulder that I felt like, F you, I'm gonna 
become good and I'm going to prove you wrong. And it was not a waste of time to learn Arabic, by the way. It was one of the best things I ever did in my life. And I didn't even start learning Arabic until after I moved to Dubai. Seriously, one of the best things that I ever did in terms of, is that like a fly? This is so weird. I shouldn't have flies in my place. I have a dehumidifier. You know, that's why I don't get any cockroaches. Right, so I was super impatient with myself because, partially because of the people, like the negative self-talk, which came on as a result of people around me who were not learning or didn't know any Arabic, but were like making me feel like I was wasting my time for doing it. And that makes you like want to work even harder sometimes because you're like, it's not a waste of my time. And again, it's one of the best things that I ever did. I can't even begin to tell you in terms of like for my business, for opening up opportunities for me, people that I've met, people that, oh, it's just like the list, it goes on and on. So if you feel like in your heart, there's something that you want to do or a skill you want to learn, don't let anybody try to discourage you. Like, how are you going to make a career from that? Like, how are you going to make money? You have to know somebody in order to get a job. And like, if you really want to do it deep down, just like nobody can stop you really. And I felt like I couldn't not learn Arabic because it was just like something I had to do. So number one, be patient with yourself. As I was saying, I just wish I hadn't been so hard on myself. I wish that I had, I mean, I, st I still studied a lot, but I just wish I had maybe gone easy on myself when I make a mistake. And that's a, a, kind of a psychological thing, really. Um, be kind to yourself. Number two, I would have worked with my Excel sheet database more, like found more ways to use it as a study tool and have uh, regular sessions to go back and review or make connections between words. So, you know, with El Kitab method, you, every chapter you build, like it builds on the vocabulary of the previous chapter, right? So you don't want to forget everything you learned in lesson one. Everything builds on, on itself. All right. And there was one thing that I could have done. I think that I would recommend that's really smart to do is like go through your database of words and randomly select like 10 words and then make a story out of them. As in like use every word in a sentence. Use all the words and make a story. All right, and if they're verbs, yeah, you can conjugate them as you wish, but yeah, make a story and then, and write it and give it to your teacher to grade or to like get their feedback on. Because that kind of thing really helps you. You're, you're using the creative part of your brain and you're like making connections between things. And I think that's really helpful for learning and solidifying the knowledge and helping you to apply it, right? Even if the story is nonsense. I mean, and this idea came from when I was in fourth grade. I'll never forget, Thursday homeworks were the worst. So Monday, we got new, every Monday we got new vocabulary words, like 10 new spelling words. And our homework for Mondays was to write the word twice. Just, you have the word written. I don't know if you have to do cursive or not, but we wrote the word and we write it twice. Tuesday homework was, I believe, to use each word in a sentence. Wednesday homework was math, like a worksheet or whatever. And then Thursday homework, so that was the worst because we had to make a story using all of our 10 vocabulary words. And then Fridays we would read the story to the class. Thursdays, it just took me forever because it's like you have all these random words. How am I going to connect these? You know, like um, I'm trying to like get some inspiration around here, like basil, 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 basil and orchid and sofa and make it like a story, you know? So I was sitting on the sofa when I saw a person carrying an orchid, like, you know, just like stuff like that, like make a random story and you can make it funny or nonsense, whatever, just do it for fun. If your teacher likes it and you read it to your class, maybe you can like get them to laugh and it's public speaking practice. I also said I would have used my breaks more efficiently. So my breaks when I was learning Arabic were like, so when I was doing private lessons, it was just me and the teacher. We, you buy them in blocks of 20 hours which would be used up every four weeks because it's I did one hour a day uh, in the higher levels. I didn't want to do two hours a day because it's too much and I wanted to save because it was like each hour is money, right? So I just do one hour a day. I um, would have like maybe a couple weeks break in between before the next 20 hour block, right? And like I'd use those breaks yeah, like when I was traveling or whatever, just to take a little break from studying and from like the long days because I had some days like I wake up at 630, do my hair, makeup, go to class from eight to nine, go to the office. And then I officially, I worked from 10 to seven, but I had to get there at like 9.15. Like anyway, you want to get there early because you had to get a parking space. And then like 
at seven, I would either, if I don't go home, sometimes I would have work. Cause remember I was doing like promo modeling and like promo jobs to make more money to pay for my classes. So sometimes I would work like 14 hour, 16 hour days. And it, yeah, it was just, it's like bur burnout, burnout. Yeah. To avoid burnout, I would take these breaks. So after like a 20 hour block, okay, I take like a, like a two weeks off or a month off. And I guess in hindsight, yeah, I do wish that I had used that time to really go over my, the database of words and be, make more like connections. Like I said, like do stories or just do a little bit of studying. Cause I think during my breaks, I really just like, I took a total break. I wish I used that time to maybe like watch a whole season of a Arabic show in a, in a certain dialect and just take notes of things and save clips and all that. So that when I went back to class, I could talk, talk to my teacher about it. So. That's another thing I wish I had done. Let's talk about things I did not regret about the way I learned. Um, one thing I definitely do not regret is putting myself out there and just speaking Arabic, even when I probably sounded like an idiot or I, even though I probably sounded wrong or like childlike. I'm definitely, my personality is like, I, I think I'm pretty friendly and like easy to talk to. And I don't get so embarrassed by trying out new sounds and new words. Whereas I, I mean, I knew people who did, especially growing up, like one of my best friends in high school, she was learning Russian and then, and she was taking Russian in college. I remember I went to visit her campus one weekend and we went to a farmer's market and there was some, one of the vendors was Russian. And I said, oh, she speaks Russian. Like, you know, Sto or what I say, Das Vidanya, I knew from the movie Anastasia, Das Vidanya or whatever. And he's like, oh, he, and my friend, like she looks at me, she's like, Shannon. And like, she was like upset at me that I told this guy that she speaks Russian, like she's learning Russian so you guys can practice. Whereas for me, I feel like, no, if somebody was saying like, oh, she speaks Arabic or she's like, I would say, oh, salam alaikum, kif haluk. You know, like, I would try with what I had, you know, um, just because like, I, I always wanna, yeah, make people feel comfortable and whatever. But the whole situation, like with that, I just remember, she was very uncomfortable with it. And so I felt uncomfortable and the, the Russian dude felt uncomfortable. So <laughs> I do not regret putting myself out there in terms of learning Arabic. Honestly though, some of my most embarrassing moments were the exact things that led to my biggest growth and change. So one example, I remember maybe three or four months into my Arabic classes, like I was a total beginner and I, I was working, you know, as, as I said, with a Saudi media company and we had a team building activity and there's like a team, like different teams uh, compete, right, for the prize. And I remember it gets time for the awards. Like I was in the, the kind of the planning team for it. So I wasn't actually participating in the things. I was kind of like one of the facilitators, announcers. And when it came time for the announcements to announce who won or whatever, the one of the directors totally put me on the spot. All right, Shannon, speak Arabic to us. And I was kind of like, I said, I farik, farik, faz. I said, I farik, faz, which means which team won. And it actually, what I said was fine. But what, so his reaction, so I said, I farik, faz. He said, oh, I think she thinks that's Arabic. And then people like laughed at me. And this guy, he, he was a native Arabic speaker. He was like a Lebanese or something, or he was Shami. And I was just like, like my face, I mean, under my makeup, my face was all red. And later on, I asked one of my colleagues, I was like, what did I say wrong? I said, I farik faz. He goes, yeah, hey, I farik, I farik faz, mina fazin, you were right. That's, I mean, that's, it makes sense. He was just making fun of you. And I was like, oh, okay. Like, but I still was so embarrassed because I was like, my pronunciation wasn't good or whatever, but. And now, if, I guess if I were, I would say, um, somebody did that to me now, I'll be like, hello, kefkum, min al-fa'izin, min yabqa yafuz. I don't know what I would say. But um, yeah, I just remember I was like, so awkward and I felt embarrassed. And it was like people like feeding into like, that kind of fed into my drive to, to even, to work harder and to study more. Oh, so another time I put myself out there, about a year into my Arabic studies, I auditioned for, a presenter role on one of uh, the Arabic channels, right? On an Arabic TV channel. And at that point I didn't speak a dialect. I was still doing the modern standard, like Fosha, like the formal Arabic. And it was for a show that was more like action oriented about cars and fights and, or maybe not about cars, 
mainly about like car racing and stuff like that. And they wanted an Arabic speaking female to present these like news shorts or whatever. And because I worked in the media company, I knew about the audition. And so I said, oh, can I audition? And they said, yeah, of course. And obviously I didn't get the role. It wasn't that good, but it was actually a really great experience for me to have like, to be memorizing Arabic lines and to be like, to, they gave me the script and like, it was actually like Shami dialect or a Shami dialect. Uh, but it was such a fun experience and I mean no actually it was terrifying in the moment but it was fun in the sense that like oh I just did something that I, I I mean when would you like how many times in your life like when you're learning a language would you be able to like audition for like a real TV show that's in that language I mean what a cool experience right just to have done it just to have auditioned was a great learning experience for me and speaking of auditions before I even started learning Arabic I had auditioned for another another presenter role with, uh, I think it was with Dubai One. So they're an English speaking TV channel, but they're produced like in Dubai, obviously. And I think it was like a lifestyle, celebrity gossip, E! News kind of thing. And I went to this audition, I think it was during my lunch break. And you had to read off a teleprompter and it was me and then this guy they were auditioning. And so you think that'd be fine, right? Like I'm good at reading. I can do things on the fly, whatever. Well, that experience is why I now wear contacts. So I, I remember looking out and I, I couldn't read what it said. I mean, how did I drive there? Well, I, I had a prescription like sunglasses. So, and I wore glasses when I needed to see things far away. So I'd always have my glasses with me. But at that point, like I hadn't even worn contacts before. I had never thought about getting LASIK or whatever. So I remember I was so embarrassed because the producer is like, like I'm like squinting and oh, it was so embarrassing because I couldn't really make out the words and that just messed everything up. And I felt like I wasted their time and I just was like, needless to say, the very next week I went out and got contacts. Oh, and a cool thing about contacts in Dubai, I don't know if they do this anymore, but like if you know your prescription for contacts, you can go to different optical shops and just say like, oh, hi, um, can I get a sample of this brand? Uh, my vision's negative one, negative whatever. And they would give you samples. In the US, they never do that. It's like you need a prescription to do like anything. And yeah, because you buy contacts over the counter there, at least when I was living there. I guess the moral of all these stories is that my best advice is to take every, take advantage of every opportunity to grow and to get confidence. I mean, if it scares you, like that audition that I did, the Arabic audition, that experience scared me to death, but it was one of the best learning experiences and it gave me confidence speaking in front of the camera. I mean, even now, like I'm not a hundred percent, oh, I'm a lot more comfortable than I was. And actually one thing that helped me get comfortable with speaking in front of a camera was using Snapchat. Like since I started using Snapchat in 2014, I've definitely gotten a lot better. My first few snaps, I remember I would I would press record and then I'd redo it like 20 times before I released one snap saying like assalamu alaikum because I was so self-conscious, I guess. A few months later, I was snapping all the time until so like I would I mean without makeup or just doing whatever, like I would just do it and release it and I didn't care. So just I guess regular practice filming yourself. If you want to be good on camera or get better at filming on camera, Snapchat definitely help me. So as I mentioned, yeah, just remember to take advantage of any opportunity that you have to grow and you're not going to get it on the first try. You're not always going to get it on the first try. Everything happens for a reason, I believe. So if I had gotten that English speaking host role with Dubai, Dubai one, I, yeah, I probably wouldn't have been anywhere near as motivated to learn Arabic just because I'd be like, so into that role and it seemed like a lot of fun. So yeah, I probably wouldn't have even thought about learning Arabic because I'm like, oh, I already have a good you know, presenter gig in English. I'll just focus on this, you know? So I'm glad I didn't get that. And I'm also glad I didn't get that, uh, the action channel, the Arabic speaking presenter role back in, was that like 2012, 2013? I'm glad I didn't get that either because I honestly wasn't ready. Like I was not prepared to, like I wasn't as comfortable in front of the camera as I am now. And I just wasn't ready. Like I language wise either because I only spoke really full at that point. So I mean, how could I have been doing interviews and you know, all this stuff. It's harder to do on the fly when you're still learning the language. So, so I'm really glad that those didn't work out because they kind of 
ended up going back into my foundation and helping me get confidence and trying new things. And then, I mean, as some of you know from other videos, like just a few years later, like I started acting in Arabic TV series and then I co-hosted a talk show with uh, Dubai TV, which is the sibling channel of Dubai One and a much bigger channel than Dubai One, at least at the time. So yeah, as I said, like everything's gonna work out for the best. Just keep like putting yourself out there and trying things. Every time that I didn't get the audition, or I didn't get the audition, I got the audition. Every time I didn't get the gig or the part or whatever, it was actually like leading to something that was a much better fit for me anyway. So that's it for today. Hopefully you guys found this video useful. Please, please like and subscribe. Love you guys. See you soon.